and Kardec. Welcome to this beautiful Sunday and I'm hoping that all of you had a very nourishing, enriching Mother's Day. We're all mothers, right? And we all have the beautiful opportunity to connect to Mother Mary. Mother Mary, who is our most divine mother on this planet. So today we will be continuing with our beautiful study from heaven and hell. And we are still, this is our last case of the hardened spirits. It's um, a group of spirits who are not literally downright criminal, but they have their challenges. Their hearts are hardened. They are stuck in their evolution and often it coincides with boredom and lack of direction. So dear friends, as you're coming in, let us connect with God and let us connect with Jesus, our guide and model. And of course, Mother Mary, Mother Mary, our divine mother, who is embracing us with her guidance, her kindness and her support under the auspices of her beautiful son, our guide and model. And we are filled with gratitude for Kardec Vedio, who is giving this divine opportunity to meet in our intercontinental classrooms where we can exchange ideas and teachings and connect with each other. And it doesn't even matter where we are. And we all speak the English language and we can connect and exchange love. So dear friends, thank you for joining. Dear Tony, thank you for being here. And so so is our dear friend. Thank you for joining. And Nora Vassil, what a pleasure to have you, dear friend. So let us jump right into our case. And um, her name is Sumini. Sumini, it's hard to say. And um, let's just assume it's Sumini. Um, in this case was came through in Bordeaux in the year 1862. A spirit used this name in presenting itself spontaneously to the medium who was accustomed to this type of manifestation because her mission seemed to entail assisting low order spirits brought to her by her spirit guide with a twofold objective, one of aiding her instruction and two, their advancement. Let us pause right here. Here's our first amazing um, lesson. So here's a medium who is giving a voice to a troubled spirit. And she seems to be doing this on an ongoing basis. She has a gift. She has a gift of an extensive mediumship. And she does it for two reasons. Her first reason is to be of assistance, to help. And what is the other reason? It is to help herself, to aid herself in her own instruction and to help the advancement of the other spirits. How beautiful. And this is us. This is exactly what is happening when we avail ourselves and offer support to either discarnates or incarnate spirits. It is really following the law of assistance. We all have gifts, and hopefully by now we have made a beautiful list of our gifts, at least the top three, but we can go down and list even more and see whether we follow the law of assistance, whether we follow the guidance that we are learning from this chapter, the twofold mission of aiding for our own self always hitting us first it's always most and foremost for our own aid and then by aiding ourselves we're aiding others so the law of assistance really reflects the divine nature God and divine providence is consistently and always flowing gifts and more gifts and more gifts our way not just our own selves everything on this planet, everything in this universe is constantly gifted by God. So then what is our responsibility? We have received all these gifts. 
what do we do with it? We'll just take nature as an example. Let us imagine a spring, water is bubbling out of it. And as long as the water runs, is moving, constantly moving, it stays clear, clean, pristine. But the minute we stop up the water, we create a lake, a puddle, or whatever it may be, we run the danger of polluting the stagnant water. It is more likely to become polluted than if it keeps running. The same happens within our own bodies. Let's look at the blood. The blood keeps moving constantly. It's being pumped throughout our bodies. The minute it stops moving, we create a condition that's called necrosis, and that leads to death. So the universe is constantly in flux, constantly moving, and so is divine providence. It keeps moving gifts towards us, and the law of assistance mandates, and this is the word that Emmanuel uses in thought and life, for us to keep the gifts flowing out to others, to serve using the gifts to serve others. So, as we receive assistance, we give assistance and assistance, and the more assistance we give, the more aid we will receive, and the good spirits and the spirits on high will recognize our willingness and will most likely give us more opportunity to share our gifts. How beautiful. So we get aided, we aid others, and we get more gifts. We get more opportunity to share our own gifts. Now what is important about this law of assistance is that we don't char charge for it. For example, in the case of mediumship, it is a gift from God that as Jesus taught us, what you've received freely, share freely. As long as we don't charge due to the law of affinity, we will be connecting ourselves with higher order spirits. But the minute we bring money in, for example, then we connect with a different level spirit, with a lower order spirit. And then we don't know what messages come through. I mean, we, we can imagine that. It's like a mathematical equation, right? So it is very important that we pass on our gifts and we do it from the heart and freely. Now we also are invited to ask for help. Ask and you shall receive. So we can ask for assistance. And again, as we receive the assistance, then we share it. And this is something that we may want to reflect upon within our own hearts and minds for just a minute. Are we doing that? Do we know what our gifts are? And secondly, are we sharing our gifts? Are we, sharing, are we sharing them freely and with joy? And are we looking for opportunities to share our gifts? Are we, uh, are we realizing that our gifts come from God? That we're constantly recipients from divine providence flowing towards us? like a stream of water, like when we take a shower, the water comes out of the, the shower head, just pouring down on us. Are we holding on to it and say, oh, no, no, this is my water, I'm not gonna share it. Or are we willing to pass it on? And this is our therapeutic moment, number one today. So you're invited, we are invited, you and I are invited to revisit our list of gifts and making sure and finding opportunities to share them with others. And this is what our friend, this medium did. She had learned that lesson already. So let us see. So she helped, she availed herself, she offered her mediumship to hurting spirits to aid herself and to help others. Our redemption really lies in our dedication to be of service because we know here on planet earth most of us have done a lot of wrong in our past 
Maybe you may say not in this lifetime, but maybe yes, even in this lifetime, but definitely in previous incarnations. So this is a golden opportunity to use God's gifts being given to us for this lifetime to help our own self, our own redemption. And there was helping others. This is a super win-win. Actually, I have this beautiful picture by um, print of Chico Xavier. And I want to share it with you. It may be reversed with a print. I'm not sure. But I'm going to tell you what it says. The good you do anywhere is your advocate everywhere. Isn't that beautiful? I wish I could type it, but if anyone wants to type it out, it is. The good you do anywhere is your advocate everywhere. And here it is. Can you guys see it? There. It's beautiful, isn't it? I have it here in my office space so that when I prepare for something, I get inspired. Reminder. Thank you, Chico Xavier, for saying, for having this wise saying, helping us this way. So let us continue with Sumi. So now the first question is, who are you? Is this a woman's name or a man's? A man's. A man who is as unhappy as can be is the answer. I'm suffering all the torments of hell. So Sumi is a man suffering. But if there is no hell, how can you suffer its torments? A pointless question. I understand, but others might need an explanation. That doesn't concern me. Mightn't selfishness be one of the causes of your suffering? Maybe. Well, we have seen that in the last few months, all the categories of spirits who are suffering in one form or another, from um, delinquents to those who've committed suicide to downright criminals and now the hardened spirits, all of them had one thing in common, absolutely without fail, and that was selfishness. Selfishness coupled with pride, so their ego was leading in their ways, and that's what got them into trouble. So of course we can get from the answers already that the spirit is selfish as well. He does not care about teaching others like the sweet medium does, right? So then she said, he said, she, they say, if you desire relief, you might start by repudiating your bad inclinations. Don't worry about it. It's none of your business, he says. Start by praying for me as you do for the others, and then we shall see. Aha, interesting. Now the spirit will say a couple more times, please pray for me. I don't even want to talk to you. Just pray for me. Why would the spirit ask for prayer? Well, we know that prayer is a concentration, an overflow of our minds and hearts, a connection with God. As Emmanuel puts it, we turn the mirror of our soul and connect with God, direct it towards God. And as we know, we know, as we have a mirror, we always reflect back what we direct the mirror towards. So if we direct the mirror towards God and Jesus, Mother Mary and the spirits on high, guess what are we getting back? What are we connecting with in our minds and hearts? We are connecting with God, with Jesus, with Mother Mary and the spirits on high our own mentors as well, who are more evolved spirits. And what happens when we reflect these higher emanations back onto us, then our minds will elevate, our hearts will be in a different space, will open more, most likely, because the source of love we receive from God and Jesus, Mother Mary and the spirits on high, is an unconditional love. It's something we can hold on to. It's not fleeting and it gives us security. It gives us peace. And in addition to that, we also attract equal spirits. So if we, during the day, have our mirror connected with spirits on high and positive messages and, and love and kindness and service, who are we surrounding ourselves with? As we think and feel, we emit and then that way we attract higher order spirits that will whisper good thoughts into our ears, hey, do this. And if we are aware of it and we tune our Wi-Fi and tune into 
their messages, it'll be a beautiful life. It make, will make our, our challenges so much easier. Now, Sumi, who is suffering, doesn't really have the willpower, and we're gonna to get to this in a minute, to pray on her own. Maybe she, he isn't evolved enough yet that he really believes in prayer, but he has a hunch that prayer could be helpful because it will create, create this beautiful, helpful um, emanation, this helpful radiation. It will attract good spirits and he needs help. So he's hoping that other people will um, pray for him that might help him without him having to do anything, right? But let's see how it continues. So he's asking for prayer. Then the question is, if you don't help me out by repenting, prayer will have little effect. If you talk instead of praying, you won't help me advance very much. Hmm. Very interesting spirit, right? So now the um, communicating um, person raises an interesting point here. They say, if you don't help me out by repenting, prayer will have little effect. Now, why would they say that? Well, we know that due to the, according to the penal code, um, what happens is the first step to our transformation when we're stuck in a dark place, and it doesn't matter whether we're incarnate or discarnate, right now we're talking about the discarnates, is repentance. And why is that? Repentance is a moment where we humble ourselves, so we get away from our selfishness and pride, we humble ourselves and we admit we've done something wrong. And we admit it before God. So twofold thing, we humble ourselves and we connect with God. It's a form of prayer. Because Emmanuel in the chapter of prayer in Thought and Life teaches us that prayer is every concentration of our minds with what we want to accomplish. So if I want to repent, and I'm admitting that I've done wrong, I'm connecting and speaking to God and, and expressing that, that focus connects me with God. It's a form of prayer, form of positive prayer. It also opens our hearts and we know what happens when we repent that moment. We know it from Nosolar and Louise. He was in the umbral and he prayed fervently that was his moment of repentance. And what happened? The good spirits came rushing to his side and helped him. And we see that in many different cases throughout the Andre Louise series. Every time a spirit starts repenting, help is on its way. So this is why this communicating incarnate says, you've got to help me. How good, will, what good will it do for you if I pray for you and you're not open we have to be aligned to the prayer that's why it is so much more powerful for us to pray for our own selves it is vital that we connect with god and repentance is the first step to connect with god in that case it's an opening and the next step is expiation and then there is um the step of um what is it, it starts with an r um, forgot it's not rehabilitation but well it'll come to me in a moment it's three steps and the whole aspect of the penal code is our ascent towards rehabilitation it is our part of our redemption it's the steps of our redemption and there is a section in heaven and hell where you can read the whole the whole chapter is dedicated to the penal code and it's all spelled out there so we need to be aligned when other people pray for us. We need to open ourselves to the prayer. Otherwise, the prayers that other people pray for us won't do as much good. So do you really want to evolve? The, the incarnate then asks her, him. <coughs> and the answer is maybe. I don't know. Let's see if prayer relieves my suffering. That's the essential thing. So somehow Sumi realized that prayer is a good thing, but he's not willing to actually do it himself, right? <coughs> then join me. 
then join with me in the strong desire of obtaining your relief. Go ahead. After the medium's prayer, so the medium prays now for him, do you feel satisfied? Not like I had wanted. So there it is. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. He was just not willing to do the work. He was not really open. He hadn't repented, repented yet. So the prayer wasn't very successful. It didn't give him the relief he wanted. So this is really important for us to take note, right? So to call a church and ask them to pray for us and maybe even pay for it is not going to give us the relief we will be looking for, particularly when we involve money. Because again, if we involve money, there's nothing wrong with money, but money tends to attract equal um, spirits that are on the level of exchange, right? It's like, okay, I give you this, then you give me this in return. But we're always invited by Jesus to give without looking for recompense. That's really one major key of, of being of service, not to expect anything back from anyone. It's just like divine providence. Divine providence isn't asking us to give thank you. I mean, I hope we do. I hope we are um, grateful for what we receive, but how often do we not? We just take it for granted. The spring where the water comes gushing out is not, the, is not waiting for a thank you and it will stop spraying water out if it doesn't get recompensed, right? So nature always teaches us of how to conduct ourselves more aligned with God's will. So we need to learn to pray for our own selves. It doesn't mean we can't help, help ask for help, but we need to at least be aligned and open for the help. Medicine administered for the first time can't immediately cure a long-standing malady, this um, incarnate says. And that's true too, right? It's never a quick fix, particularly if the ailment has existed for lifetimes, potentially, maybe even millennia. So it's not one prayer is not gonna turn things around, right? We go to the doctor once, boom, we're healed. Most likely this is not the case. So then he says, perhaps not. Would you like to come back? Yes, if you call me. So what impression are we getting? This is the whole case. What impression are we getting from this spirit? Well, if we want to summarize it, Sumi is selfish, is, has some kind of an idea that prayer might be a help of help. There's some power in prayer. But Sumi is also lazy. The willpower isn't there to actually do the work, to take charge and do his share to release himself of the torment he's feeling. And that is his downfall. Now let us look what we're learning further. There is a medium guide, medium's guide. So the medium's guide speaks, is the guide, like a mentor, of the medium who allowed the spirit to talk through her. Remember, she was the one who does it on an ongoing basis, offers the service to help herself, educate herself, and to help spirits in need. So here is the guide of this medium speaking now. And it says, daughter, you will have much work ahead of you with this hardened spirit. How sweet, right? It's just like, don't give up, just keep going. It's this encouragement, it's this love, it's this gentle, sweet encouragement we receive from spirits on high. It's so touching. Courage, have courage, the spirit tells her. Persevere and you will succeed. And this spirit guide is talking to us. We are this lady. We're being told to have courage and to persevere, to never give up, not to give up with our own selves and others, both incarnates as well as discarnates. Persevere and you will succeed. No one is so guilty that he cannot be amended by means of persuasion and example, since even the most perverse spirits end up amending themselves with time even if one doesn't succeed immediately in leading them back to good sentiments, which is often impossible, 
One's efforts will not be lost. And that is the key. We need to practice patience. Patience with our own selves, patience with all those family members that might be very close to us these days if we're still in social isolation, or friends and co-workers. Sometimes during the days when we used to go to our jobs, we work very closely with co-workers and how frustrating it can be. But we're told today again to be patient because everyone is at their own level of evolution and nobody will get stuck. Everyone will evolve. So let us be patient with others, but also let us be patient with our own selves. It always starts with us, right? So he says, the spirit says, one's effort will not be lost. And this is another consoling piece of information that we need to take note of. Our efforts will never be lost. Even if we don't see any results, maybe we even imagine that things are falling back or getting worse. As they say, things get worse before they get better, right? But the idea is the efforts will never be lost. Why? It is like a seed. We put a seed into the ground and for a long time we may not see anything happening, but underground, as there's, I think there's YouTube videos where we, we can watch now there's cameras in the soil. Have you ever watched that? When you see a seed in the soil, it grows down first. It creates the roots and we don't outside of the soil. We don't even know what's going on. We may think, oh my gosh, my, my, my um, seed is, is dead. It's not growing. Nothing's happening. That is what is meant. This is the same mechanism with both discarnate spirits as well as incarnate spirits. All of our efforts are like a seed. They are planted. We may not see the result, but eventually the seed will germinate and come up and we'll go, ah, I'm so relieved. It's growing after all, right? Spring is such an amazing time for this where we get impatient, like what happened to my seeds? And then we impatiently plant more and in the end we come up with a million zinnias in our garden. We didn't even want them, right? So this spirit guide so says, the thoughts one kindles in the other spirits stir them up and make them reflect despite of themselves. These are the seeds that sooner or later will bring forth fruit. So tonight, today, we're invited to remember that all of our efforts, that the gifts we receive from God as we pass them on, and we may sometimes work tirelessly, and if we don't see any improvement, no results, nothing, let us trust that these seeds are growing roots. They will do the good eventually, even if we don't see it. We may not even see the result in our lifetimes, but let us have faith. Let us have faith. Hmm? So, one does not break a rock with the first strike of the hammer. That's a beautiful picture that we can hold on to. It's usually a rock does not break with one hammer blow. It takes several. It's like drip irrigation here on the west coast our soil is so hard and it's so lacking particularly here in the foothills here in nevada foothills lacking so many nutrients so people go with a jackhammer into the soil can you even believe it so but in order to not use a hammer or jackhammer to break the soil and create a garden drip irrigation just every day we water the ground a little bit until it softens same method. What I'm telling you, my daughter, also applies to incarnates. And you must understand why spiritism, even among firm believers, does not make perfect human beings immediately. And do we know that? We are probably living proof of it. That even spiritism is not the magic wand that goes, Oof, sunshine, now you're perfect. No. It takes probably many, many lifetimes at least for me, to finally have the beautiful seeds that I'm planting in this lifetime germinate and allow me to be a different person. Maybe sometimes we see I see little sprouts, but it will take a lot more time. But it is important to keep studying and practicing the good news, to keep practicing 
the lessons. It's just the water that's being poured onto the seeds that Jesus originally, but then Spiritism, which took the torch to us, planted in our gardens of eternity. Believe is the first step. Faith comes next and transformation will have its turn. But for many, it will be necessary to go to the spirit world to renew themselves. And there we have it. It's not always done in one lifetime. So this spirit says, believe is the first step. So we need to believe in our own selves. We need to believe the teachings. Then we need to believe in our own selves and capacity to transform. And faith is needed. Very important to have faith. To have faith in God, have faith in Jesus, have faith in the teachings. And lastly, or maybe firstly, have faith in our own capacity to transform and make the shift. And then the Spirit says, the transformation will happen. So we're reminded again that the process is, as Emmanuel teaches us in thought and life, twofold. We're studying, we're studying, it's more seeds, more seeds, and then we're invited to practice what we've learned because the gifts has come through the studying, but as we earlier said, the gifts are we're mandated by manual and the spirits on high to pass them on and to practice. While we pass them on, we practice them, we practice them. And that's the love, that's the service. So we need two wings to soar, like a bird. We need the mental part, the studying, and we need the practical part of practicing the good, of loving our neighbors, of sharing our gifts. When we finally have understood through the many studies that Jesus is not only the lawgiver and Jesus did not just come to this planet to heal others and he is not just our guide and model and he's not just our teacher but when we finally understand in the depth of our souls, our hearts and also our minds that Jesus is the renewer of our life, which whose components are the lawgiver, the guide, the model, the healer, the teacher. But he's actually all of it and renews there with our lives from the inside out, from the inside out. And that's the important thing. It's the soul education. It comes from the inside out versus regular education that we often encounter here on, on planet Earth which we have in schools, which comes from the legal system, from our governments, is from the outside in, right? Like, don't do this, do this, learn this, and you know, it's this outside in. But Jesus works from the inside out, renewing our life. Jesus shines his sublime teachings and lives his exemplary life to help us get there, to understand what it means to renew our own lives. He, he's the whole deal. He gave us everything. All we need to do is, all we need to do is love. <laughs> it's a song. I'm not going to try <clears throat> to sing it, but all we need to do is study and practice love. Hopefully, we will open our doors and invite the gospel, the good news, Jesus' teachings into our own homes. And thank you to this virus that we have brought our spiritist centers from their different locations into our own homes. So we can start turning our own homes, not only into living quarters and, and sleeping pads and kitchens, but into a temple into a beautiful temple that we beautify our homes, we clean them up, we invite Jesus in, we hear the knock and we say, yes, Jesus, come on in. Help me renew my life. I want to understand your teachings. I want to practice your teachings. I want to know your teachings. That is, I want to feel your teachings. Remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus was so smart. He was the professor of the law. He knew it all. But what was the missing piece? that Jesus gave him. And he, Nicodemus is us. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to feel the teachings. You need to 
renew your life from the inside out. Take me into your heart. Bring me into your homes and let us work together. And that's when we become active sowers, active sowers of his infinite love, infin infinite love. It is so beautiful, friends, isn't it? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Mother Mary, for giving Jesus a body. The Blessed Mother, right, on Mother's Day. Thank you, mothers. So now we're going to wrap up with um, Alan Kardec's expose. He says, among the hardened spirits, which is the category that Sumi falls under, there are not only wicked and evil spirits. There is a large number of them who, without trying to be evil, remain stationary out of pride, indifference, or apathy. So there is many spirits who are not downright evil, but they are prideful, indifferent, and have apathy consequently. The last two weeks we looked at spirits who were, had boredom. Their willpower wasn't activated. So that was a big problem. So these spirits are unhappy nonetheless in that they suffer all the more from their inertia because they don't have worldly distractions as compensation. The perspective of the infinite makes their situation intolerable to them. And yet they have neither the strength nor the will. Let's listen. Neither the strength nor the will to exit the situation. So these hardened, this Sumi and other hardened spirits, the last two weeks in particular, they weren't downright evil, but they didn't put their willpower to work. Their pain was not somehow strong enough to initiate their process towards their inner transformation. Can we imagine that? Are we like that? Are we kind of complacently unhappy, almost attached to our lower vibrations and we don't want to give them up? We need to look at that, right? Because the invitation, we have all the material. I mean, the door is wide open. All we need to do is step it, uh, through the door. Or the other picture is Jesus is always knocking on our door. All we have to do is open the door and let him in. So then he says, the perspective of the infinite makes them worse. They are those individuals who, while incarnate, lead idle existences, useless both to themselves and to others, and who often end up by committing suicide. See, here we see one of the reasons. Unhappy, not really having an initiative to turn things around, not selfish, prideful, not connected with God, and it often leads them to commit suicide. In general, these spirits are more difficult to lead back to the good than those who are downright evil. Interesting, huh? Since the latter have energy. Once enlightened, they're as fervent for the good as they were for evil. For the former, many incarnates are needed to evolve appreciably. Incarnations are needed, so I say that again. Once these spirits are enlightened, they're as fervent for the good as they were for evil. For the former, many incarnations are needed to evolve appreciably. However, little by little, defeated by boredom, like the latter by suffering, they begin to seek a distraction in any sort of occupation whatsoever, which later on will become a necessary necessity to them. So what is Ellen Kardec saying here? Let us take it apart. The first thing we hear is, is that it, these spirits that have apathy, indifference, and of course are prideful, which all of them are, all of us are to a certain degree, right? Um, they are harder to inside to um, change than the spirits who are downright evil. Now, why would that be? The downright evil are easier to help them, is easier than those who are not downright evil? How, how can that be, right? That's an interesting question. Well, but we're getting the answer here. So those who are downright evil, they've used their willpower towards the evil, towards doing bad things. So they, have, they show initiative. They're at least active. Now the other category of those who are ap apathetic and bored and their willpower is idling. Once 
they're finally ready to make the shift, they still have a very weak willpower. So they're less likely to wake up all of a sudden and say, oh, now I'm going to do the good. And now my willpower is going 100 miles an hour and I'm invested in the good. When before they were kind of like hanging in the ropes. But those who were like fervently evil and now they wake up, now their willpower that was already active before they woke up for the, to the good, they're using the same willpower now to do the good. Actually, we see that in Paul of Tarsus, right? So he was a fervent believer in um, persecuting the early Christians. He was very invested in pleasing God and loving God above all things. He was a very fervently, um, very strict Jew, and he was very much into the teachings. And he believed he was doing the right. He showed passion towards the good in his eyes. Now, Jesus appears to him. That is his wake-up moment, right? Like with most of us or all of us. And this willpower, this desire to do the good, whether it was correctly doing the good or not, he used now to really do the good. So Paul of Tarsus is really the most amazing experience um, of what Ellen Kardec is teaching us here. And it makes sense. So we have to keep in mind for our own lives that we are accountable on three different accounts in our lives. One is for all the evil we do. So-called evil is defined as lack of consciousness, right? We are ignorant. So for all the ignorant things we've done in our life, we are of course accountable, law of cause and effect. Now the second category of things we're accountable for is all the good we have left undone. So we may not downright act evil or do the evil things, but we might be sitting on the couch all day long and we think we're really not doing anything bad, but how much good did we omit in doing by being lazy, by not focusing on the good? So we're accountable for that. That's the second category. And the third category, now that's even one step further, is out of all the good we have left undone, there might have been evil coming out of this. And we're accountable for that too. Whoa. So is that an initiative for us to get off the couch and do the good? Particularly us who we know, we know spiritism, we know the teachings. We can make the list of our gifts and let it flow. We need to let it flow. Not only for the good of others, but also for us to stay healthy. Emmanuel teaches us that in thought and life. We get sick if we stop up the flow of gifts and we don't share them. And plus we make ourselves guilty. So this is, this is really important. So if our friend drops a banana peel and we don't pick it up, then we haven't really done the evil of dropping the banana peel, but we also omit it. We didn't do a good thing by picking it up. So now we keep walking and then all of a sudden we hear it crash behind us. Somebody slipped on the banana peel. So this is the evil that happened as a result of us not picking up the banana peel, which would have been the good we could have done. So there it is, it's just the example. Now, what we also, what, what Alan Kardec also helped us to understand is, as we said earlier, that the apathetic and bored spirits, their willpower isn't, isn't really um, activated. So why is that of importance? Well, Emmanuel gives us the answer in the chapter, I think it's chapter three in Thought in Life, where he says our will is the manager of all the different departments in our brain. We have the department of memory, we have the department of desire and, and so forth. We, there's many, many different departments in our minds, in our brain. The will is the power, is the, is the manager. It's like a corporation. So now in Liberation, beautiful book by Alan Kardec, uh, by Andre Louise, which we are studying now every Saturday, Carol Curry and I, what a blessing. We are conducting a study session. Well, in this book, Liberation, um, the instructor, Gubbio, teaches us if we choose not to use our will, 
we become pawns of predominant circumstances of our surrounding. So it's just like a flag that's on a pole and it doesn't really have well power, right? So whatever direction the wind comes from, that's where the flag goes. So this is us, the flag is us. If we don't engage our willpower, if we don't choose to use our will, we become pawns of the predominant circumstances in our environment. And that can be and is then most likely not so positive. So as soon as we use our will, Gubia tells us, then we need to choose which direction we're going to point it at, right? Because as we said earlier, we can use our willpower to do evil things, to commit crimes. And we see that in liberation. The spirits in the lower zones, wow, they're intelligent. They are organized. They live in colonies only with only one goal, to do evil things. They have their willpower very much aligned. They're very clear of what they want to do. But for us, we need to ask ourselves, what direction am I giving my will? Am I giving my will towards the good? Am I getting up in the morning and make God's to-do list? What good can I do versus what do I need to do? Okay, I need to wash the laundry. I need to clean the house. I have to go grocery shopping. That's just, of course, these are all necessary things. No question, you know, no judgment whatsoever. But hopefully we also, or predominantly, have it in our mind and our will is directed towards even if we go grocery shopping or wash the laundry to do the good, to fill our, fulfill our duties with love. So our mind, Scubio teaches us, is between two forces. The higher forces, the superior forces, and here's the mind, and the inferior forces. Makes sense, right? We can either connect with the higher forces or we can connect with the lower forces. And Gubio teaches us that the entryway for the lower level spirits to connect with lower forces, with the inferior spirits, is where in our bodies. Where is the entryway for us to potentially connect with lower level spirits? Well, it is in the sexual area and it is in the abdominal region. So it's in the sex organs and it's in the abdominal region, according to Gubbio. This is interesting, right? So how do we connect with the, with the higher spirits, with the superior forces? What are the entryways for us to connect with the superior forces? What do you think? Well, We've said it before, it's actually pretty clear, it's our hearts and minds. As we pray, we always say, let us open our hearts and minds and connect with God, right? Those are the entryways potentially for us to connect with the higher spirits. So now, how, which direction are we going to go? Are we going to use the abdominal region like food? We eat meat, every single meat meal is, is, is a steak or um, heavy foods, or, you know, and again, we're not judging, we're just pointing out, we're just raising awareness, right? Passing on teachings. Or are we drinking a lot of alcohol um, and creating like a fermentation in our, in our abdominal region, which will detoxify um, our inner organs and make the liver really heavy and fatty, so it can work really well. Or are we, Focusing on what crime can I commit next? How can I do get more money next with our minds? It's up to our will. That's where the will comes in. Let us activate, activate our will and know the two different forces, entry portals for higher and lower connections, spirits, energies. And let us use our will, not an idle will, but a stimulated will to do the good, to connect with the higher forces. And then we can bless our lower forces. We can 
create balance or maybe even pull the lower forces up and sublimate them towards the higher forces right so this is this is really really important for us that the will needs education the will needs to be directed a the will needs to be activated so we're not becoming apathetic and bored and lazy and then we need to know which direction we're going to direct our will or do we want to connect with the higher forces via our hearts and minds through prayer through study through music through nature through art there's so many ways how we can i'm sure we all have our ways to connect with the higher higher spirits higher spirit realm with god with jesus mother mary and healing doctors who are all phalanges of god of jesus or do we direct our will towards the lower forces we're reminded of the cross right when we see the cross in the middle of the cross right there right there right there this is better where the the horizontal and the vertical intersect is our brain so we can either stay horizontal or slow slowly further down which is connecting with the lower um, spirits or we connect with the higher forces it's beautiful and the intersection is this um, balance that we invited as incarnates it's it's what we invited to negotiate so we want to close with a beautiful proposal this beautiful book our daily bread there is a chapter and it's chapter 66 and it is titled of course goodwill goodwill because we want to be stimulated we want to walk away from this gathering and we want to know how and what the potential is of us activating our will forces towards the good opening our hearts and minds connecting with god turning the mirror of our souls our hearts and minds towards god so we can reflect back the love the light the gifts the the blessings so here it goes and this book is by emmanuel emmanuel is teaching goodwill good will goodwill finds work to be done work leads to renewal Renewal finds the good. The good expresses the spirit of service. The spirit of service brings understanding. Understanding brings humility. Humility wins love. Love leads to self-denial. Self-denial reaches the light. The light promotes self-betterment. Self-betterment sanctifies the individual. The sanctified individual converts the world to God. Proceeding prudently through simple goodwill, the individual reaches the divine kingdom of the light. So the proposal, the invitation is for us to come closer to developing the divine kingdom, which is not of this world, as Jesus taught us, within our own selves. And we do it by activating our will forces towards the good. Because when we do that, we will find our goodwill will find work and work leads to renewal. And renewal leads to the good and the good leads to the spirit of service and the spirit of service helps us to understand and understanding brings humility right it does humility wins love love leads to self-denial how can we love if we don't self-deny ourselves self-denial reaches us links us up to the light and the light pr promotes our self-improvement. And our self-improvement sanctifies us. And as we, as an individual, are sanctified, we will convert the world to God. Because once we have nourished and established the kingdom of God within our own being, 
then we let it flow out remember it's the gift and we give it to the others and one breath at a time one thought at a time one feeling at a time we convert our own selves towards the good and help others to do the same dear friends let us with gratitude close our eyes if we can connecting one more time turning the mirror of our souls and connecting with god and jesus our beautiful guide and model and we're connecting with mother mary in particular today grateful for this team of love having come to earth and now helping us from the other side and we are so grateful to the healing doctors and the spirits on high, the phalanges of love and light, aiding us continuously day in and day out, and our own mentors who are next to us, helping us, guiding us, whispering good news to us. And we're thanking Kodak Radio for this beautiful platform of connection and teachings. And lastly, we will rekindle our willpower in the week to come, making a list of our gifts and how we can employ our willpower to make use of these gifts to help our own selves, help our own redemption while we help others, turning this world into a beautiful garden, into a beautiful kingdom of heaven. And with this and so much gratitude in our hearts, we close tonight's study session. Dear friends, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Rita de Casia and Gabriel, Ignacio and Mark, Carlos. Thank you, friend, and Nora Brazil, Lisa Tellis, and, and who else? So Sosa and Tony. And I think there's more, but thank you, friends, for joining. Much love. And so, God willing, we will meet again next week, same time, same place. Good night.